If Stanley Tookie Williams were a vicious gang leader who now teaches school kids how to avoid becoming what he used to be, Williams says since he's been on death row, he's had time to reflect on the violence and destruction he caused by founding the Crips. Working together, we can put an end to this cycle that creates deep pain in the hearts of our mothers, our fathers, and our people. Meet Stanley Tookie Williams, a guy who went from being just another troublemaker on the streets to becoming a big shot in the Crips gang. His story is one heck of a ride. Back in the day, Tookie was just like any other kid from the block, but he got tangled up in some rough stuff. He started running with the wrong crowd. He found himself drawn into the dangerous world of gangs and street life. But then things took a crazy turn. Instead of sticking to petty crimes, Tukey became a leader in one of the most notorious gangs around, the Crips. It's a real-life rags-to-riches tale, but with a twist. Instead of money and fame, Tukey gained power and influence on the mean streets. Working together, we can put an end to this cycle that creates deep pain in the hearts of our mothers, our fathers, and our people. But here's the kicker. Tookie's story isn't just about crime and violence. It's also about redemption and change. While behind bars, he had a change of heart and started working to steer young people away from gang life. But because he's all three, an inmate on death row who teaches inner city kids how to avoid joining gangs and a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize, his is a 60-minute story. Now, at age 50, Stanley Williams is literally trying to rewrite his violent history. So buckle up, folks, and get ready for a wild ride through Tukey's world, from being a regular gangbanger to becoming a Crip King. Born in New Orleans in 1953, Williams had a tough start. He quickly learned the harsh realities of life when his father left the family just a year later. His mother, Louisiana Williams moved them to Los Angeles, California, where they settled in the tough streets of South Central. With his mother working multiple jobs to make ends meet, young Tukey found himself often left to his own devices. Growing up as a latchkey kid, he roamed the streets. As you can expect in situations like this, Tukey found himself mixed up in all sorts of trouble. From hustling with older folks to betting on street fights, his childhood was far from ordinary. He even got paid to take care of dogs injured in dog fights, a sad reality of the streets he called home. As he grew older, Tukey's reputation as a tough guy only got stronger. He was kicked out of school for being too intimidating and found himself in juvenile detention more than once. Amidst the chaos of urban life in the 1960s, the Black Panther movement emerged as a beacon of hope for many African Americans, including youth like Tookie. Inspired by their message of empowerment and resistance, Tookie found himself drawn to the ideals of the Panthers, but as the movement waned, he turned to the streets for solace and belonging. But the real trouble began when he was accused of a robbery he says he didn't commit. When he was just 15, Tukey got caught stealing a car and was sent to a place called Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall. While there, he got into weightlifting and became stronger. By the time he was out at 17, he was a force to be reckoned with. After his release, Tukey met Raymond Washington, who had heard about Tukey's toughness. They decided to team up and form a bigger gang called the Crips. At first, they wanted to protect their neighborhood from other gangs and the police. In an interview with Vlad TV, an original WS Crip member and a co-founder of the 8 Trey Gang, Melvin Farmer, talked about how the Crips gang started. So Raymond Nim came over there, got into it with Tookie Nim, and he was coming home on the weekends. They scheduled a meeting at St. Andrews Park, and that's when the Crips start forming east side, west side. Compton. Obviously, things didn't go as planned. The Crips grew too big and too violent. They started fighting other gangs instead of protecting their community. Soon, they were the most feared gang in town. Tookie's Crips recruited heavily, challenging other gang leaders to fights. Many gangs joined them, but some resisted. 
These resistant gangs formed their own alliance called the Bloods, becoming the Crips' biggest rivals. Today there are about 150,000 gang members in the Los Angeles area, split between the Crips and their rivals, the Bloods. So far, at least 5,000 lives have been lost, all because of a decision made by Tookie and Washington as co-founders of the Crips gang. But as the Crips expanded their territory, so too did their list of enemies. With power came consequences. Tookie found himself constantly in the crosshairs of rival gangs and the police, who blamed him for every crime in the city. In an interview with a source during his imprisonment, he said, I was always known for being a fighter. When I was beating people, I would make sure they knew it was Tookie who was hitting them. I was a megalomaniac and wanted my gang to be the biggest in the world. At first, it was all about fighting, but then the Crips became too big to fight, so the other gangs started shooting. He continued, People started dying, friends of mine, but you never think it's going to happen to you. The thing that makes people most dangerous is when they start believing they are invincible. Tuki led the West Side Crips with his friend, Curtis Buddha Moreau. Together they struck fear into the hearts of both criminals and innocent people. Tuki became infamous for his violent acts, often avoiding punishment due to lack of evidence. Even after his early involvement in the gang, Williams lived an ironic double life in which he worked in a legal job as an anti-gang youth counselor, helping troubled youth in Compton, while also serving as the overboss for one of the largest gangs in Los Angeles. Williams would work as a counselor and study sociology at Compton College during working hours, then spend his free time participating in numerous violent attacks against the Bloods. He also had this thing for working out, which made his body look all muscled up, making him contest in an amateur bodybuilding contests. In an interview, Ice-T talked about meeting him in one of his contests. Walk into this bathroom, who's in the bathroom? Took you them and push-ups, right? Buffing, getting in sets, because they wanted to be super swole when yeah. they hit the stage. Yeah. Uh, I'm in there trying to pay, man. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was denied an opportunity to compete in an amateur bodybuilding contest, after it was discovered that he was a gang leader, Williams would later appear on the popular 1970s NBC game show, The Gong Show, performing a pose-down routine. Eventually, his gangster lifestyle was beginning to take a mental toll on him, which included a brief stay in the psychiatric ward of a hospital after Williams experienced a bad trip while high on PCP. With each of these setbacks, Williams increasingly found himself using PCP and supported his drug habit by intimidating and robbing drug dealers in South Central. He lost his counseling job in 1977 after being implicated in a robbery that was committed by two youths from a group home that Williams supervised. And then in 1981, Tukey's life took a dramatic turn when he was convicted of multiple robberies and M's crimes that would ultimately land him on death row. Rival gangs and internal conflicts threatened to tear the organization apart, leading to a cycle of violence and retaliation that claimed many lives, including those of Tukey's closest allies. Tukey Williams was a man surrounded by controversy. In 1981, he was convicted of four counts of M in two separate incidents. The prosecution's case painted a chilling picture of Williams orchestrating robberies that turned deadly, leaving innocent people dead in their wake. The first incident took place at a stop-and-go supermarket, where Williams and his accomplices allegedly planned to rob the store. Thankfully, the robbery was thwarted and no harm was done. However, this was just the beginning of a tragic series of events. The second incident occurred at a 7-Eleven store where Williams and his associates confronted the store clerk, Albert Lewis Owens. In a chilling display of violence, Williams shot Owens twice in the back, unaliving him in cold blood. The senseless loss of life left a community in shock and mourning. But perhaps the most heinous act attributed to Williams was the massacre at the Brookhaven Motel. In the early hours of March 11, 1979, Williams allegedly stormed into the motel lobby, shooting and unaliving four members of the Yang family who ran the establishment. 
The brutal nature of the kings shocked the conscience of the public and left a scar on the community that would never fully heal. Throughout the trial and subsequent appeals, Tookie Williams maintained his innocence, claiming he was framed for the crimes and that the evidence against him was weak, pointing out there were no fingerprints or eyewitnesses linking him to the crimes. Even the shotgun shells found at the crime scenes didn't match his gun, he said. However, the prosecution argued otherwise. They presented a firearms expert who testified that the shells matched Williams' shotgun. But Williams' defense team criticized the expert's methodology, calling it junk science. Critics also pointed out that Williams, despite renouncing his gang affiliations and apologizing for co-founding the Crips, continued to associate with gang members in prison. But when questioned, the Los Angeles Police Department couldn't find evidence of his gang leadership. Some opponents even accused him of receiving money from supporters, implying that his actions were insincere. Yet Williams's spokeswoman insisted that people supported him because they appreciated his work, plain and simple. The composition of the jury also raised eyebrows. Williams' lawyers argued that the jury didn't reflect the diversity of the community. They claimed that African Americans were underrepresented, and three black potential jurors were dismissed from serving. However, the prosecution provided evidence that there was at least one black juror, although the defense disputed his racial identity. This raised questions about the fairness of the trial. Williams's journey didn't end with his conviction. He spent years in San Quentin State Prison, where he was involved in violent incidents, leading to six years of solitary confinement. Then, in 1988, he was stabbed in the neck by another inmate, causing serious injuries. At first, he continued his gang life within the prison walls, but it appeared he soon came to see the error of his ways. William showed signs of change. He hadn't violated any rules since the late 1980s, according to John Boxer Mendoza, a former high-ranking member of the Nuestra Familia. He was incarcerated at that time. Stanley Tukey Williams was at this particular prison, right? Yes, he was. Did you know each other at all? He was my neighbor over. Tukey was a, was a good dude. This transformation caught the attention of many, including those who advocated for his clemency. In another interview, he said, it didn't happen overnight. There was no epiphany. It took six years of solitary confinement, of soul searching, to realize what I had become and that I didn't want to be that person anymore. Soon afterwards, he began his anti-gang work. The part I love most is working with young people. That's the absolute highlight of my day. Yet even in the face of death, Tukey refused to succumb to despair. Behind bars, he found solace in religion and redemption. During his time in prison, Tukey underwent a transformation. He renounced his past life and became an advocate for peace. He even reached out to rival gang members, urging them to put aside their differences and work towards peace. Together, we can put an end to this cycle that creates deep pain in the hearts of our mothers, our fathers, and our people. At the age of 50, Williams rewrote his life story from his prison cell. Despite his past as a gang leader, he went on spreading a message against violence and gangs. He wrote nine books for kids, warning them about the dangers of gangs, drugs, and prison life. Even on death row, he was using the internet, TV, and radio to share his message. Don't join gangs. I turn my life around, and you can too. What was remarkable then was that schools were inviting him to talk to students directly, even from death row, well, of course, through a phone. Particularly in places where gang violence hits closer to home for many students. Some had lost friends to shootings. Those students, having read William's book, were eager to ask him questions. Hi, my name is Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Hey, uh, my question is, your book talks about transformation. How do we know it's sincere? Uh, my work speaks for itself. It took uh, years and years for me to uh, experience a change. I started off reading a lot. It opened up a new world for me, and uh, in time, I developed a conscience. 
His efforts garnered international attention, earning him nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize and sparking a debate over the nature of justice and rehabilitation in America's criminal justice system. The Nobel Peace Prize isn't awarded for what your past is like. You don't have to have an unblemished past. It's awarded on the basis of, have you made a contribution towards peace? And that, I think, is what is, what is true of Stanley Williams. But despite his efforts at redemption, the debate over Williams' case extended beyond the courtroom. It sparked discussions about the justice system, rehabilitation, and redemption. Some believed he deserved a second chance, pointing to his efforts to denounce violence and promote peace. Others remained skeptical, questioning the sincerity of his change. Stanley Williams is no Mother Teresa. What do you think he's trying to accomplish with these books? Well, I think that all of this is all part of uh, uh, his way of attempting to escape the executioner. However, the evidence presented in court seemed to point overwhelmingly towards his guilt. Eyewitness testimony, forensic evidence, and Williams' own actions seemed to paint a damning picture. Despite his claims of innocence, Williams was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death. His case became a focal point in the debate over the death penalty, with supporters and opponents alike weighing in on the morality of executing a man who claimed to have turned his life around while on death row. Tookie's execution went ahead as scheduled in 2005. Tookie Williams faced his final moments on Earth. He was led into a room surrounded by people and strapped to a bed. But this wasn't just any room. It was the place where he would take his last breath. Tuki knew this, but he didn't show fear. Instead, he relied on his faith. Before Tuki was executed, he said something powerful. Redemption is tailor-made for the wretched. This means that no matter how bad things seem, there is always a chance to make them right. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you've done. Redemption is for everyone. As Tuki lay on the bed, the people around him could see his struggle. He didn't resist, but he didn't give up either. He wanted to smile at his advocate to show her that he was okay. Beckney, Williams' advocate, reported that prior to Williams' arrival in the death chamber, he had promised her that, he would find a way to lift his head and smile at me at some point during his execution, no matter what was being done to him. And that is exactly what he did. Even though the process took longer than usual, Tuki remained calm. Although CNN reported the staff had difficulty inserting the needles and the usually short process took almost 20 minutes, Tuki showed no resistance, shedding only a single tear as he passed away. In the aftermath of his death, Tukey's supporters vowed to continue his fight for justice, determined to prove his innocence. His body was laid out for viewing, drawing thousands of mourners who came to pay their respects. A memorial service in Los Angeles brought together people from all walks of life, from former gang members to celebrities and religious leaders. But perhaps the most important moment came when Tuki's ashes were scattered in a lake in Thokoza Park, in the city of Soweto, South Africa, fulfilling his final wish. As his voice echoed through the church during his funeral, urging others to avoid the destructive path he had once walked, it became clear that Tuki's legacy was one of redemption and hope. Today, Tuki is remembered not only as a street legend, but also as a man who dared to defy expectations and strive for a better future. His story serves as a reminder that no matter how far one may fall, redemption is always within reach for those willing to seek it, and that even in the darkest of times, there is always hope for a better tomorrow. And that's all for today. Until next time, peace out.